Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship of today on this 14th Sunday of Pentecost. Uh, We are in our second rained out Sunday service, but it's great to be back in the uh, sanctuary today and to hear the organ again. So thank you, Jane, for making that possible for us. In your bulletin, you will find um, a number of announcements toward the back pages there, and I commend those to your, to your reading. Um, for one thing, our preschool will be starting up again on Tuesday morning. Very exciting time for all of us to welcome 11 students to here for preschool this year. Um, and then also I'll mention that next Sunday, Uh, We have God's Work, Our Hands Sunday, uh, where our, um, primarily our council members, but others as well, will be preparing a meal for the uh, folks who come together at PADS in uh, Ottawa. So we will be doing that, and I am hopeful that that will lead us into some regular service um, in and around our community here. There are a few cucumbers out there, I noticed, uh, on the back table. Please help yourselves to those. And also there's an um, offering plate there for uh, offerings that you might have brought with you. There, is also, there are also some um, bl- uh, empty envelopes that you can use for any donations you wish to make toward the ELCA uh, World Hunger initiative and Lutheran disaster response funding. The needs are great, as you might expect, uh, with wildfires in California and with hurricanes and flooding um, down to the south. So please consider that as well. Are there any other announcements um, that we need to make? Oh, yes, Marcia, thank you. Next Sunday is the next. Next Sunday is the thirteenth. Is my understanding? Do we have a typo there? I'm not sure. Okay. Anyway, think about it and let me know okay. <laughs> before you um, leave today. We'll have the dinner. Yeah. Oh. Right. Are there any um, particular needs that you? would want us to pray for uh, this morning in our worship. (coughs) Okay, hearing none, then I will, oh, yes, Deb. Mm -hmm. You bet. We will add that to our list of prayers. Yes. They're really suffering. They had a t- I only touched my dad once in six months. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for bringing that um, to us as a prayer petition. Okay? Uh, the <clears throat> Jordan, Dutch sister was over the rising house. They've been penned up a long time ago. Okay. And we need probably all the prayers to those kids who don't understand what's going on. Okay. So they need their prayers. Okay. Horizon House. Horizon House. That's a, they have a home in Mendoza or over that. It's a mm-hmm. it's for special needs too. Yeah. They all have just kids, adults too. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you for mentioning that. Okay, if there are no other prayer petitions, I'll invite you to stand as we begin our service with the confession and absolution. Blessed be the Trinity, one God who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all of creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Father, 
Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to live in you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call in our need, and through his death and resurrection, God, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ, led by the Holy Spirit. Let us live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. Amen. We continue with the first verse of our gathering song, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. People of God, Hope in the Lord. The Holy One hears us and welcomes us as God's own. We are as sure of God's faithfulness as we are that the sun rises each morning. The Lord who loves us unconditionally will lift us up and keep us in God's care. Together, let us worship God with joy. I invite you to pray with me. O oh Lord God, enliven and preserve your church with your perpetual mercy. Without your help, we mortals will fail. Remove far from us everything that is harmful and lead us toward all that gives life and salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated, and we will invite Chris forward to share with us our readings from Ezekiel, Psalms, and Romans. The first reading for this 14th Sunday after Pentecost is from Ezekiel chapter 33, beginning with the seventh verse. We read, So you, mortal, I have made a sentinel for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked ones, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity but their blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from their ways, and they do not turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but you will have saved your life. Now you, mortal, say to the house of Israel, Thus you have said, Our transgressions and our sins weigh upon us, and we waste away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? What of God, what of life? Please read responsibly Psalm 119, beginning with verse 33. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your teaching. I shall keep it with all my heart. 
Lead me in the path of your commandments, for that is my desire. Incline my heart to your decrees and not to unjust gain. Turn my eyes from beholding falsehood. Give me life in your way. Fulfill your promise to your servant, which is for those who fear you. Turn away the reproach that I dread, because your judgments are good. All along for your commandments, by your righteousness in living in me. The second reading is from Romans chapter 13, beginning with the eighth verse. We read, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone. The day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Word of God, word of life. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Gospel according to Matthew, the 18th chapter. Jesus said to the disciples, If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened, listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. I think we have even a few more than two or three here today, so we are in good shape. Well, after hearing the gospel lesson that I just read, I imagine, can only imagine what you're thinking. This newly minted pastor is going to preach to us about church discipline and how to get along with each other in our life together here. Good luck with that, you rookie. I have always dreaded the day when I would preach on this gospel text for the first time, and it's finally here. And now that it is, it's not as intimidating as I thought it might be. For you see, in my eight months here at Emmanuel, 
I haven't seen many fractured relationships or irreconcilable differences or egregious moral lapses. Why is that, I wonder? Maybe I haven't been looking hard enough. Maybe I am overly optimistic. Maybe I haven't been here long enough to see cracks and divisions. Maybe there is conflict, but it lies under the surface and it's not very evident. And maybe there isn't any conflict. Now, I can't answer those questions. Only you can, and please, don't answer them right now because we don't want to have any knockdown drag out fights here in the sanctuary. We have enough conflict around us in the world as it is. Today I hope to talk about our life together in this community of faith so that the church increasingly can become a beacon of hope and light and love in this community in which we are planted. I believe that that's what Paul is calling to, uh, us to do in our New Testament lesson today from Romans 13. Paul's or overarching attitude and message here seems to be that love for God and neighbor is the basic virtue that informs and guides and fulfills all of God's commandments. The mission of God and the church must be bathed in compassionate love for others. This is how Jesus operated during his short time on earth, and this is how he commands us to function in this world. Love has the power to transform people's lives in ways that align with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the love that we demonstrate activates God's love in other people. Perhaps that's kind of like how the coronavirus spreads. We spread, God, spread God's love to others, and then they pass it along, who then pass it along to other people as well. That might be not the best analogy for us in the midst of a pandemic, <clears throat> now that I think about it. Yet, the principle is clear. Love must be our lifestyle. We must live and move and be molded by the desire to love in the way that our Lord Jesus did. Not such an easy thing to do always, is it? especially two months before what could be a very contentious election. Turning our attention to today's gospel, we learn that this text comes from the portion of Matthew that is called the Community Discourse. Found mostly in chapter 18 of Matthew, the Community Discourse addresses life in the church, forgiveness, and discipline. As in last week's gospel from Matthew 16, Jesus speaks of the church's authority to bind and loose, um, part of the Jewish law. Um, and he says, he gives authority to Christians to um, bind and loose as well. Whatever the church looses on earth in terms of laws will be loosed in heaven. Now Jesus' expectation is that the church will exer exercise this authority according to the ethical principles that Jesus has set forth in Matthew's Gospel. And one of these principles, perhaps the most important of them, is that Christians prioritize loving God and loving neighbor, the two greatest commandments. And notice here in the Gospel, the strong link with the second, our second reading from Romans, which speaks directly about love. In verses 15 through 17 of our Gospel lesson, Matthew gives individual congregations the right to confront, exclude, 
or ostracized disobedient members who have sinned against God and other Christians. We know this process, of course, as excommunication, literally throwing a member, an individual outside of the faith community for his or her offenses against others. And of course, these would generally be very grave offenses, um, things like slandering, heresy, blasphemy, adultery. The most notable person that I can think of who has been excommunicated was Martin Luther about 500 years ago now. And he was excommunicated by, excommunicated by the Roman Catholic Church uh, 500 years ago for his failure to recant his radical beliefs about salvation. Considered heresy by the Roman Catholic Church of the 16th century, Luther's teachings have become the foundation of evangelical Lutheran theology, the faith that we profess today, and have also um, influenced the beliefs of our Roman Catholic friends and neighbors as well. Although congregations have the authority to discipline members whose sins are hurtful to each other, we do not take this responsibility lightly. If the occasion arises, and that's probably very infrequently, we look at the process that's outlined here in Matthew 18. First, the person harmed by another reaches out and meets with the offender in an attempt to resolve the situation and bring about reconciliation. Non-judgmental, honest, and careful listening and sharing is the key to the effectiveness of this process. Seeking to understand another person is very difficult, especially if we're the one who has been injured. If, after that first step, you are not listened to, the next step, according to Matthew's Gospel, is to involve one or two other people in meeting with the person who has sinned. And if that still doesn't work, the third step is that we take it to the church assembly. And if the offender refuses even to listen to the church, then it is time, as Matthew says, to treat this individual as a Gentile or a tax collector. Now what in the world does that mean? Jesus, of course, even ate and talked with tax collectors and Gentiles. The rationale for mentioning these two groups is that they were outside of the faith community of first century Christianity. But even after this fourth step is taken, we treat the offender outside of the community then through excommunication. But that is not the end of the story. Even though the offender and the offended may no longer worship or commune together, we are not to give up hope. We don't say something like, oh, that person is dead to me. We don't ghost them on social media. As Christians, we don't withdraw our love and care even though the sinner is outside the boundaries of the faith community. We keep the door open to reconciliation and that person's possible return to the church. And of course, we continue to pray for them. An ineffective way of handling conflict in a church is for the aggrieved person to talk about what has happened behind the offender's back. Do you know what so-and-so said to me or did to me? Well, let me tell you. Isn't that awful? I am never speaking to him or to her again. When we avoid going to the person who may have caused the problem, we create a triangle 
and the conflict can spread through a church like wildfire, making it difficult to resolve. It's like spreading COVID-19 at a college party. So the two words I want to suggest that we keep in mind for this week are community and relationships. Remember that the early Christians to whom Matthew was writing were situated in the midst of the Roman Empire, which demanded undivided loyalty to the emperor. The empire dictated everything about life for the Jewish people who were among the lowest citizens of society. Yet they had now pledged allegiance to the kingdom of heaven and their savior, Jesus Christ. How were they going to live as disciples committed to God's rule in the midst of a hostile empire which might even persecute them? This is what the Gospel of Matthew attempted to outline and address for these new Christians. And I believe that much of Matthew's advice is still useful for us today. Christians both then and now are called to respect each other, to be accountable to one another, to show relentless, relentless commitment to reconciliation when problems occur, and to repeatedly forgive each other. How many times? Seven? No, 70 times seven. Our life together is a network of relationship and practices among fellow disciples. We don't cause each other to stumble, but we look out for each other. We live in humility and trust, supporting each other in our faith, lifting each other up when we feel weak. We may not always agree on everything, but we follow Matthew's process of reproof and restoration when it's needed. Reconciliation, which goes even deeper than forgiveness, is at the heart of the mission of the church. Indeed, this is what God modeled so beautifully for us in the death on the cross and the resurrection of his son. Now I will admit that I'm a bit concerned about how the next two months before the national election, the election are going to play out in our society, in our community, in our church, in our world. There is so much conflict and chaos in our midst and there's no guarantee that it's going to cease after November 3rd. But here is something I'd like to make clear. Whether we identify with the red party or the blue party or some other political persuasion, whether we always wear a mask or we never wear a mask or sometimes we do, sometimes we don't, I hope that we can agree on one thing and that is to put the white garment of our baptism above any other affiliation. For this marks us first and foremost as God's beloved children, washed clean from sin and marked with the cross of Christ forever. This is our first and most important identity. In Jesus' name, amen. And now we respond with our song of the day. Um, as we gather at your table, the first verse. We confess our Christian faith and the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended from hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Unite your church, O God. Grant us the gifts of repentance and reconciliation. Bless the cooperative work of churches in our community. Strengthen ecumenical partnerships. Guide the work of the Lutheran World Federation and the World Council of Churches. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Protect your creation, O God. Teach us ways that do not harm what you have created and entrusted to our care. Renew and enliven places suffering from drought, flood, storms, or pollution. We thank you, Lord, for the generous rain which you have given us today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Turn nations and leaders from ways that lead to death. Shape new paths toward peace and cooperation, teaching us to recognize one another as neighbors. Guide legislature, legislators, civil servants, judges, and police toward laws that protect the well-being of all. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Tend to all in need of your compassion. Hear the cries of those awaiting justice and those yearning for forgiveness. Give community to the lonely and neighbors and shelter all who are vulnerable in body, mind, and spirit. We pray especially today, Lord, for the those who are served at Horizon House, those with special needs there, and also um, people everywhere, older people especially, who are confined to nursing homes and cannot feel the loving touch of their families and friends. Be with them and with their caregivers as we continue through this pandemic. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We remember with thanksgiving those who have died in faith. As you equip them, equip us with your protection and power until with them we see your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, all these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us temptation. Deliver us from evil. Power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, we will postpone our sharing of the peace until the end of the service. As you're leaving, please feel free to greet um, one another with a sign of peace. And um, I will move to the altar now for the consecration of the elements. Let me simply um, give you a word of instruction. 
We are using the individual communion cups with two seals on them right now. So after the consecration of the elements, I'll invite you to come forward. Please distance yourself, uh, if you will, between family units. And um, then take one of the cups, return it to your place, and I uh, return to your place, and I will at that point give you um, instructions for, for communion. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to all to drink, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Also on that night, he took the cup, gave thanks, blessed it, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you remember me. And at this point, we will invite you um, to come forward to receive one of the cups, take it back to your place, and we'll continue from there. Come to the banquet. All is And now may the Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true faith to life eternal. Amen. Loving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and lead you in the way of truth and life. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Remember the poor. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.